Say when. <laughs> Come on, I can't get into it. Say Three. when. Smile. Three. Smile. Smile. Three. Okay, that's good. Here we go, folks. We're doing a test. We got Chris Palomares here behind the electronics. We got the microphone set up. We got Dave Davis, Dirk Reynolds, Chris Palomares, and myself, the host of the What's Neat weekly, uh, monthly show at Model Railroad Hobbyist Magazine. And tonight we're doing a test of the visual podcast ideas that we've got in mind for setting up this show. So at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Chris. Well, you know, part of this is we're going to be touching upon the past of the Midwest Valley modelers. I was personally really inspired by. Your, your first article in Model Railroader Magazine, um, I, 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 it, it just opened up a lot of things to me. And it, it helped generate what, you know, I wanted to go with Fremo. I wanted single track, I saw in one article, but I liked what you did with, uh, with your scenery, the, the cohesion of just all the modules together as a whole, uh, the theme of it too. I didn't realize it was a Route 66 theme until more recently. That happened in 97. The layout changed from the first to what it turned into. I went to a meet, a meet in 1987 or 88 up in Chicago, and I think it was either Santa Fe's meet or it was that prototype modeler's meet that they've got. They didn't call it that at the time up in Schaumburg. Is that where it used to be? And I saw Bob Kozik and his brother, Matt Kozik, and those gentlemen had articles in Mainline Modelers of their Super Chief cars that Bob had made. And I was like, holy cow, there's a rock star at this show. Because I was a modeler at the time. You know, I, to me, if you were in the magazines, you were, you were a rock star. And this guy was. His work was just beyond anything I ever saw. And then I saw the modular layout that they had built, the Midwest Modutrek layout. And at this point... I had already been in and out of a couple of clubs in St. Louis, and I just wasn't getting out of it what I was looking for, so I wanted to start my own club. And looking at that layout, that gave me the option of not having to actually have a permanent location, but I could put that layout that we were going to build that was going to be similar to what I saw Matt Kozik and Bob had, and we were going to put that in vacant storefronts because I was in real estate and I had a lot of vacant buildings here and there and my partners did. So we could occupy vacant spaces to keep the layout set up all year and just move it around because it was modular. And right. living in an apartment complex, it was the only way I could swing it. I didn't have my own studio, my own basement. So we were off to the races. I was on the phone with uh, the Koziks for hours, primarily uh, Bob. And he told me what the radiuses were and how they designed this and designed that. I changed the radiuses from their 30-inch up to 48. I changed the way the layout was put together. I tried to take their concept and, and, and kind of change it a little bit so it was more of something I felt comfortable with that I knew would work show after show after show and not be damaged. And we were after a General Motors display, professional lighting, black cloth. And it came off pretty good the first few shows. And then after that... Um, God, I could go on forever on this. Don't get me started. In 97, we changed it to the Route 66 theme. And, mm -hmm. you know, the layout. And I ended up getting to the point where I started doing commercial jobs for manufacturers, for Bachman and things like that. And the layout just had to go. It, it couldn't be part of my life anymore. So well, let's take that further. Let's take that into 2017, into a hypothetical. So what would be the Midwest Valley Modutrack layout or modeler's layout now based upon... The things that we've learned in the past 20 years from 1997 to 2017, what are the things that have the hobby kind of pulled into its, uh, I'd say its niche and uh, kind of expanded upon? Well, I got to tell you, it's, and I'm not really into it, but the electronics are, are huge today yeah. and simpler and less expensive. Iowa scale electronics is designed for modular layouts. Right. That would probably be one of our first things to look in, would be designing it around their concept and how to wire that up between modules. I would definitely probably not use 1x4s as bench work. We'd stick to all foam mm -hmm. with either magnets to hold them together or some sort of a metal framework of folding legs. I would simplize it and I would weld together metal this time rather than wood. Okay. But now the track. Uh, the one thing that, that Ken was perfecting, and, and I uh, at the time was selling commercial tires and, and brought a, uh, a railroad track repair company, the owner over here, and he was absolutely amazed at a number 18 switch on a curve operating flawlessly. Which, by the way, when we were in Kansas City, 
The only layout that these brass trains with brass engines would run on was this layout. Yeah. And that was after Ken got away from, you know, using uh, commercial track and started building his own switches. Yeah. And they were smooth and they were derail proof. And that was just an amazing thing. But now today we have Central Valley Tie Strip. We have Proto 87 stores with their track hardware that, that that has every part you're gonna need. You don't. You know, it, it even imprints a little drive spike for God's sakes. But they right. have the rail braces, the sliding switch plates, the guardrail retainers, the guardrails, and now the guy has come out with a self-guarded frog, which is a frog and a switch with a little layer on top to where in real life with the, when the when the wheels kick out it, it pops them back in right and this is this is something that uh, you know the track is really important because if you're going to detail your cars and have rotating bearing cap trucks like what Ather produces and other companies now you know why ignore the track your cars are beautiful your engines are beautiful the scenery is is outstanding I mean even stuff Kim was doing 12, 15 years ago still holds up today, but now there's just some easier ways to do it. Yeah, you know, Proto 87 Stores has a lot of really progressive things that, you know, he's working really tightly with uh, Central Valley on some of these self-guarding frogs. That's and, neat. I like well, that. And, the, and the tie strip. I, I, and what, from 5 to a 17 switch, they have all these? Yeah. Well, let, let's also talk about, you know, minimum radius. Uh, what was the minimum radius of... Uh, of the modular layout in the 90s. Do you guys remember? Let's see. You went the Midwest to Valley layout? Yeah, you yeah. went to. I was at 48 inches. I was a full eight. The layout was nine and a half feet across. So I took advantage of those because I wanted to be able to run full length and still be able to have that transition as you went into the curve on the modular layout and still have the ability to switch out modules with new ones and have the track still match up. So Dirk, do you, you run a lot of passenger trains. Do you think that a 48 inch or would it, would you think that a, a more Modern layout now would be more at a 60 inch minimum radius curve. You want to get as wide as you can because otherwise, the cars that you have today are so nice. Yeah. You want them to look right when they go around a corner. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. and most of these, if you look on the Union Pacific, they almost look like they butt up together. There's hardly any diaphragm there anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the tighter you get, you don't want that car going like this. You know, it just, that looks horrible. That's or seeing like the outside rail. Right. Yeah. It's, it's like, you don't want that. You need the sweep, mm -hmm. you know, to carry your train through smoothly. Well, this, is, this lends to Fremo and not being sentenced to a basement where you have to make these unnatural curves. Or Fremo and, you know, being able to have some, some real estate. Well, you yep. can do it in your basement, but you're going to eat up a lot of room. Right. Yes. Right. Well, you know, if, if you think about a layout now and... If you make a layout, say, 13 feet wide, you can do a continuous running sort of scenario and still have a 60-inch radius curve with easements. Yeah. And if you have a 60-inch radius curve with easements, you start hitting that prototype look as a kind of, you know, maybe even put a, a little bit of super elevation on it, too. That I've tried that. Yeah. And it looks really good when that train goes around you can see the the physics that are involved as you know I want to come in that curve fast well then you got to bank that curve right so but another thing is that has come up too today the wheel sets today oh right are so right. much better than the wobble even if you were buying the uh, the, the <laughs> other metal wheels from way back and mm -hmm. I can't mention any names but I mean you know they're out there and you still to get away from the plastic wheel to get rid of the wobble and you went to got the, the metal wheels and you still got the wobble you know unless you're modeling right. track like what, what I mile model some 10 mile an hour track you know you're you know, you're gonna get that but you're not gonna get it everywhere so Dave what do you think it would be progressive if this new modular layout kind of set the standard for HO and just pulled the trigger and said at a minimum we're gonna be semi fine scale code 88 wheels with a uh, ability to run fine scale do you think what's your thoughts on that absolutely I mean you gotta I, I'm at the p88 I, I may never be at the p86 yeah but then you know you were you're kind of going after the majority of people I mean even still the p88 you know yeah. a, a lot of people are, are buying cars today 
uh, not necessarily locomotives, but, but the cars with the P88 wheel set. And, you know, when you're taking pictures and you're taking video, and sometimes what really separates that shot, not just the coupler, but when you see that wheel overlapping the rail, you're using scale rail, everything else is scale, your coupler and everything is, and all of a sudden you see that wide overlapping wheel, and you're like, hmm. and, but, but the P88 tracks well. Yeah. And I do, my track is 10 mile an hour stuff, and it's, as long as the truck's self-equalizing, that stays on pretty good. You know, as we start talking about these more fine scale things, um, what's your impression of the layout height? What was the original Modutrack layout height, Ken? They were 51 and a half inches and I matched their height exactly. There was no yeah. reason to change. The number was dead on right. 51 mm -hmm. and a half inches put it right at where I could see when I was in my late 20s and early 30s. Right. So actually, you know, phew, gee whiz, I'd rather have new eyes than another model that I can't see. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, when, when you're going through the trouble of super detailing some of this track, you know, if you're going to put joint bars on it. And, and in a modular sense, it actually makes a lot of sense because, you know, you're only dealing with, what, six feet of track at a time? You know, so but the height is right. You run it more in your face. Yeah. Without being, you know, for train layout. shows, it kept the kids off of it. It wasn't a kid's layout. It was an adult layout. I had a lot of parents offended at the fact that they had to hold their children up to be able to see the layout. But that yeah. saved so many trains from hands. You know, everything we ran, we'd have eleven thousand dollars worth of brass on the layout. At a time. I know that because at one of the shows, a brass dealer guy comes over here. He adds it all up. He walks around the whole layout. He walks with me. Says, "You got eleven grand on this layout." I'm like, "Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know." I paid for every nickel of it, but it's what gave the presentation because at the time the brass was a standard. Right. You're not going to look at a bunch of, pardon me, pardon me, Chris, but you're not going to look at a bunch of Atherton wide nose engines with bent handrails running along at full speed on a layout pulling some cars. But you <laughs> are going to look at a consist of super cheap Santa Fe cars that are perfect. The Challenger set was $4,500. You add an ABB A set of F units, you're at another $1,500. So you're looking at a $6,000 work of art. Now that's something to display. And Absolutely. that's what we gained for, and that was in all the photography, but I didn't weather the brass. It wasn't until we got into plastic really heavy that I got into the weathering, the making the models look good. And that was always a shortcoming of brass, was it looked so clean on the layout all the time. Yes. And that in photos, that was, that was tough to see too. But you pulled it off though, I gotta tell you, you pulled a lot of those photos off. So, you know, you, you talk about brass as sort of like being able to run it is sort of like the equalizer for, for a layout now, especially a modular one. You know, it's not something that a lot of layouts are kind of pursuing right now. It's, uh, you know, the foundation's in the track, and then when you start running your brass, that's when you start finding things. Well, at this point, brass is obsolete compared okay. to the quality of plastic. I mean, look at the handrails on all the Atherin stuff. Um, look at that turbine that came out from Shane Wilson, I mean that is beyond brass. That's a $700 plastic model that is better than brass and at the same time the brass models are selling for $3,700. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, if, well, I don't know what I'm trying, trying to say, but to brass do. is obsolete these days. The handrails are too clunky, they grind, they growl, they don't have sound in them, you gotta wire them with lights. Um, I think it's a collector's, it's a, still a collector's hobby, but it's not what the modelers choose at this point. But would you say that, you know, designing a layout today for more finicky brass trains to run successfully will mean better trains, you know? Oh, absolutely. If you're handling a number 20 turnout on a curve, there's nothing better than a brass big boy to run back and forth to check your work. Right. But look at the repairs you had to do to brass over the years to get them to work. We got good at it, and it oh, was to the point where we could fix it. A guy brought me a turbine one day on the lat, said, could you fix it? He just bought it. I think at the time he paid over $1,000 for it, and it wouldn't run on our 48-inch radius right. curves because as soon as the trucks turned, they would hit something inside the body, and they'd short out because one truck was positive, the other truck was negative. You hit the frame, the frame is positive. The train shorts out like a line L. I said, you sure you want me to fix it? He's like, oh, yeah, I want it to run. So I got in there with a Dremel, I started cutting up this brand new locomotive, and I got it to run perfect. And the next day, Monday morning, the hobby shop called me up and said, we'd appreciate it if you wouldn't fraternize with our customers. I said, hey, the guy wanted it fixed, I fixed it. It That's wasn't right. designed to run, it was designed to set on a shelf. Yes. So don't, don't even come at me at that. Well, you know, that's a good segue for this right now. I just want to say that, 
you know, for everybody watching this that's a modeler and you're interested in Ken Patterson's technique, check out KenPatterson.com. I'm sure you'll find something that you will find very handy in, in your modeling pursuits. Yeah. So go it's there, have, have a quick look and, and see if there's anything of interest to you. And going back into something else that, you know, you'll see around this layout here, and it was kind of revolutionary on the Midwest Valley Modelers layout was lighting. I've seen a lot of modular layouts kind of take from that and now we have LED lighting. So it, it runs cooler, you can do a longer span of it. How do you envision a new Midwest Valley Modelers layout with the current lighting solutions that we have? Do you still think that they would be uh, a post sort of hovering or would you actually consider like build a, a valence and a backdrop? No, I wouldn't do that because you got to transport it. Transportation was already bad enough for 12 modules, yeah. Uh, yeah. 12 times 2, 24, 25 heads, track light heads. We had bent the conduit, run the wire through the conduit, put track light heads on it. I'd simply screw in LED bulbs in those track light heads. I would design it the same. If you can find heads to fit the conduit, I would design it the same. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't go with the wrong strip and long valence because now you're looking at eight feet times how many all the way around the layout. Okay, I'm only burning 80 watts of electricity, but I just took up another 25 square feet of rental truck space. It's you got to quantify the transportation and keep it simple, stupid kind of a philosophy. So, would you envision like a a backdrop in this day and age, or would you just run without the backdrop and? I let the scenery and the tall trees be the backdrop, so the operators behind the layout could fraternize with the customers out front of the layout and talk and exchange mm -hmm. conversation about the questions. So I'd still eliminate backdrops because then it's like in your face. There's no communication. The guys are sitting in the back. The women and the men are eating their lunch at the table in the middle of the layout, and there's no interaction going right. on. If you don't have backdrops, you force the interaction because if you don't talk to them, they're going to talk to you. Right. So I no Good backdrops point. on a modular layout unless you're so low, mm -hmm. which we won't be. We're up high. Mm -hmm. So I just I don't want to go there. I don't think I would. I don't think yeah, I would. Interaction is where it's at. You want to you right. hear the questions. That's 50% uh, of the train show. I mean, the, I will tell you that I have spent my entire weeks and lives and time working on the layout, getting it ready for the next show, getting it ready, getting it ready, everything's set up. Boom, 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 boom. You get to the show and it's quiet. You're standing <laughs> there and you're thinking yeah. to yourself, is That's this true. what all of that was for? I'm standing here drinking coffee. I'm looking at all these people, looking at the layout, and I'm like, was what was this for? There were times when I asked myself, "What wh is this? What this is about?" I didn't, you know. You get to the end result, it's like, okay, so what is it now? I got there. I was there a few times. You know, I'm going to answer that question. Uh, I think now we have kind of a duty as you know modelers to to share and express, you know, a higher level of execution of modeling because there's people out there that just don't know it even exists. You know, it's, when I first saw uh, Jeff Myers, Butch Eiler, you know, all, all the guys from the weathering shop. I had no idea weathering could be that way until I saw something painted that looked like a photograph, but it was painted by hand. And knowing that that was out there kind of invigorated me to, to you know, try to model at that level. So I think a modular layout kind of shows off this side of the hobby that kind of hides in people's basements mostly. Now the RPM meets, these railroad prototype modelers meets are all about that. Right. People want to share. It's not yep. a contest orientated thing. It's people want to share and people want to know. And I think that's one of the reasons why I helped co-found the, the St. Louis prototype meet. Because right. that's the direction we were going in. Yeah. And it works great. Even still today, it's taken over by other people who are doing a magnificent job getting people here from all over the country right and but the neat thing is is yeah people want to know and people want to tell right look at Bob Rivard he is absolutely excited about you know relating how he why he even wanted to get his layout the way it is why he does all the cars he does and he's there's just he's just one example of many and look some of these people have turned out to be manufacturers look at modeler's choice yeah there was a guy right Tangent there too. brainstorm guy yep Tangent, another one. Yeah. But it all comes back to, like what Ken said, you're going to put a backdrop there and close off yourself. I think microengineering started in the basement, didn't they? 
He did. Mr. Rand's father, the father, and then the two sons got involved, and that turned out to be a big company. Uh, well, big, small company that's well, got a big product. And took Railcraft and turned it into a, a great company, what it is today. Yes. Right. Yes, uh, there's... They've been good but to the me for the years. The interaction is huge. Yeah. And it needs to be. That was the first model railroad photo I ever shot was microengineering. I don't know how I found them. I just remember cold calling one day and I was down there. <laughs> I was like, wow, a track manufacturer. This is magic. So on that note, I think uh, we can wrap this up. This is the, I guess, the, the, the pilot episode of What's Neat This Week. Video. Video. Um, I... I I think this is going to be kind of a, a, a new endeavor. You're, you're going to edit the first one. I'm going to edit the first one. So this is going to be fun. So we'll see how this goes. This is, All right. this is what's neat this week or what's neat. What do we call it? Anyway, what's neat this, this week. This is what's neat. Ken Patterson, Dave Davis, Dirk Reynolds, and Chris Palomares saying goodbye for now. Um, actually, if you have any thoughts or suggestions, please leave them in the comments box and like or dislike this video. Let us know what you think. Like it. Let us uh, kind of answer your questions in video. And also, we want to get some interaction from everybody out there. You see us at a train show. Come up and say, hi, we saw you. We're excited to talk to you, everybody that, that's watching Very much us. so. so thank you for watching. Yes, thank you.